be interesting questions, but if you only had one question to ask, I think we could do a little bit better. Don't you try this one. Computer, what are the winning Powerball numbers for the next Powerball lottery? That's better, right? If you're single and you're wanting a mate, you could say, Computer, will I find my soulmate? Or you might want to say, who is my soulmate, right? Here's another one, a little more serious. Computer, how will I die? Or you could say, when will I die? Did you want to know? Now it's getting heavy. Let's try two more. Computer, what's the meaning of life? That's a good question. Try to find a better question than that. Well, I have one. The most important question that you could ask an all-knowing supercomputer, the most life-changing answer that we could seek would be the answer to this question. Computer, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This is the question that every single man, woman, and child must answer. Some people barely take a look into this question. They hear a professor or a relative or a friend kind of scoff at Jesus or put him down. And without any effort on their part, without any investigation of their own, they just conclude, oh, Jesus is a fraud. I don't believe. Now I can just do whatever I want with my life. Others ask that question and they start searching. And if the Lord opens their eyes, they see the truth. Ask a brand new born again believer, who is Jesus? And they'll practically shout, he's my savior. He's my everything. Jesus is the central figure in all of human history. And Jesus is the central figure in all of eternity. For all the doubters, for all the believers, for all the skeptics, skeptics, for all the hopers, wouldn't it be nice to have an answer to this question once and for all? Who is Jesus is the most important question that any of us could ever ask. Computer, who is Jesus? There is an answer to that question. There is a truth on who Jesus is, and there is a reality that goes along with the answer to that question. Now, there are a million opinions about Jesus going off in all different directions, aren't there? And if we're being honest, sometimes we can be overwhelmed by all of those opinions, and we can even become a little confused. John the Apostle, the disciple that Jesus loved, as he nicknamed himself, wrote his gospel for the exact purpose of trying to help us answer this question. If Jesus is a fraud, we are the worst of fools. Even his teachings, which are the most beautiful words ever spoken, the most wonderful things ever written down, it doesn't matter. If he is not the Son of God, his testimony about himself carries no weight. If Jesus was a liar, don't waste another minute of your meaningless life in church. But if the answer to that ultimate question comes back, he's the Son of God. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the life-giving Messiah, the Savior, the Creator, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Well, then we've got to do something about that reality, don't we? If Jesus is the Christ... That changes everything. The goal of our series called Jesus in 2020 is to understand who Jesus is. When you figure out who he is, when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to his reality as the central figure in the universe, and when you begin to see his heart, when you can begin to see who he's all about, you're going to fall in love with him. To know Jesus is to love Jesus. While he was walking the earth, Jesus made very specific claims about who he was. And for the next eight weeks, we're going to be looking at the I am statements that Jesus made about himself. Here are the I am statements that we're going to be studying. Today's is, before Abraham was, I am. Then it's going to be, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. 
I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, just so happens to fall on Easter Sunday. And I am the vine. Jesus set the entire world abuzz. And the question, who is Jesus, was on everyone's lips. And it was what everyone was obsessing about with their minds. Read the Gospels. This question had electrified the entire region. And Jesus answered their questions. That is the road that's ahead of us with our new series. So let's begin. Our scriptures for this week and next week take place in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths. You're going to learn a lot about that festival next week. But what we need to know for our scripture today is that the question, who is Jesus, has reached this fever pitch in Jerusalem. You couldn't go anywhere in the entire nation of Israel without Jesus being the center of every conversation. His teaching his presence, those who had encountered him, and of course his miracles, had turned the whole country upside down. Now at this epic feast, this celebration, Jews from all over the empire have squished into the city limits to celebrate God leading the Israelites through the wilderness after they were freed from slavery. The religious leaders and Jesus are about to engage in a knock-down, drag-out dive into the text. We're in John chapter 7. This fight takes place through both chapter 7 and 8, so we're just going to get it started and we're going to pick it up at the end. Now at the festival, this is verse 11 of John 7, at the festival the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Among the crowds there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Can you see the dynamics at play here? The religious leaders are standing lookout. They've got spies throughout all the city, and they've got spies waiting at the city gates. Where is he? Let's get him. They want him dead. They certainly don't want him getting into the festival and causing trouble. While all of this is going on, the people are whispering, He's awesome. I think he's great. He's the Messiah. Others disagreed. No, he's tricking the people. He's a deceiver. You should be asking, why are we whispering? Well, they were whispering about it because the religious leaders were ready to bring the hammer down on anyone who was supporting Jesus. The leaders were all about control. Jesus made them very afraid. But what they didn't know was that, and we're going to read this next week, is that Jesus has already snuck into the city. Jesus blends into the sea of people for a while, and then, when the time is right, he begins to speak. And as soon as the religious leaders realize he's here, and he's doing his thing, they send soldiers out to go and arrest him. And so the soldiers march out with orders They're determined to get him. Several hours later, something shocking happens. They return empty-handed. They have defied their orders. And when they were asked why Jesus wasn't standing before them in chains, the soldiers said, we never heard anybody talk like him before. They were mesmerized by his teaching. Their eyes were open to things, and they didn't dare arrest him. They'd never heard anyone talk like him before. So without the backing of the soldiers, the religious leaders and their followers begin an epic, days-long argument where they're trying to shout him down and discredit him, prove to everyone that Jesus is lying, and it's going to get pretty nasty before it's done. So let's jump back into the story. We're pretty deep into the argument. We're going to jump to chapter 8. We're going to pick it up in verse 21. Chapter 8, verse 21. Three quarters of the way through this argument. It's been going back and forth nonstop. Once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? 
Is that why he says where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below. I am from above. He's telling us who he is. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? They asked. Who are you? It's that question again. Billion dollar question. Who am I? Just what I've been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. To the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth that sets us free is that Jesus truly is the Son of God. When you know that Jesus is real, when you know that He is who He says He is, then you're free from every fear and worry in this temporal life. Well, how do we know this truth? By trying it out. If you hold to my teaching, Jesus says, you've got to try Him out. You don't need a miracle to believe. Try doing what He said. His ways are good. His ways are proven. Come find the life that Jesus is pointing you to. Hold on to His teachings, and then you will be able to know the truth about Jesus for a fact. They answered Him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? So they were offended. And they run to their safe space. Father Abraham. It's ironic that they argue that they've never been slaves. Did they forget the reason why they were at the festival that they were at? They had been set free from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Later in their histories, the Assyrians carried off a bunch of them. The Babylonians finished them off, carried them off, and enslaved them. Not to mention their current occupation at the hands of Rome at this moment. Did they already forget about the crosses that lined the road that they passed on their way into town for the festival? Have they already... What Jesus is attacking is their religion. The Jews put their confidence in the fact that they were Abraham's kids. Abraham was their grandpa, so they don't have to worry about anything. Abraham was great. His faith was amazing. God made him promises. We're going to get an inheritance from that. They, put, they should have put their faith not in Abraham, but in the God of Abraham. That's where they went wrong. And this is what Jesus was here to show them. He says, there's a worse slave master than some foreign power. And now the argument's going to take off like a runaway freight train. Look at it. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a, so a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you're Abraham's descendants, yet you're looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you're looking for a way to kill me, a man who's told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? 
If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs, whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you don't hear is that you do not belong to God. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Have you ever had an argument with someone and maybe you've done this or they've done this, but whoever is losing realizes, like, I don't even know what to say anymore. And so they just go on a dead-on, evil, personal attack filled with swear words and all kinds of things. Like, no longer the issue doesn't matter. You know what? You are a bleepity bleep, right? Calling Jesus a Samaritan would be like calling a black person the N-word. It was forbidden. You don't do it. It's unacceptable. You can't go there. On top of that slur, they degrade Jesus by saying he is just a puppet of some demonic, evil spirit. Think about who Jesus is and then recognize the incredible humility right here. These guys, for what they've just said, deserve to have fire rain down from heaven on them. This is holy, almighty God they are talking to. But Jesus doesn't nuke them. Because he's trying to win them. Something for us to remember too when we're engaging in arguments about faith. The goal isn't to nuke them. The goal is to win them. I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus. But I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, so did the prophets. Yet you say whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus knows who he is. And now we reach the crescendo of this intense argument. Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do not know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it, and he was glad. You're not yet fifty years old, they said to him, and you've seen Abraham. Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Who are you? Who are you? Tell us! Finally, Jesus lets the mic drop. Before Abraham existed, I am. Am. Instantly, the crowd moves to brutally murder Jesus on the spot. They start grabbing stones and winding up. If you're unfamiliar with the story of the Bible, this statement probably seems a little wacko. I am? Why was saying that the trigger? I am who I am is the answer that God gave to Moses when he appeared to him in the burning bush <clears throat> when he was calling Moses to rescue Israel from slavery. So God is known as the great I am. So when Jesus dropped before Abraham was I am, they understood exactly what Jesus was claiming. Jesus was saying, I am God. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am your creator. I am your God. And they tried to kill him on the spot. Do you notice that people who can't accept Jesus as God try to kill him? Even to this day, they try to disprove him, they flaunt their unbelief, they mock believers, they try to de evangelize the world. When someone tells me, Oh, I don't believe in God, I believe in science, I want to go crazy because I'm like, science just shows you how awesome our God is, right? There's something desperate at the bottom of this. If Jesus is God, then I must 
respond. If there is no God, I can be my own God. This is embedded all the way into original sin. If Jesus is Lord, then I can't be the God of my little universe. If Jesus is Lord, then every choice I make for good or evil matters. If Jesus is Lord, then there will be a judgment. If Jesus is King, if He exists, then I can't do whatever I want. There's accountability. Our society is doing today what we just witnessed the Jews in our Scripture trying to do. They're applying all of their energy to try to disprove the reality that Jesus is God. Even if that means trying to wipe Him off the face of the earth. As if that was even possible. In prep for this encounter that Jesus had over several days, Jesus explained to His brothers why He couldn't just go waltzing into Jerusalem for the festival this year. He said, The world cannot hate you, but it hates Me. I testified that its works are evil. Why do people not want God to exist? Because their deeds are evil and the light of Jesus exposes it. Jesus is awesome, but His light reveals all my darkness. And if I'm too prideful to allow Jesus to heal my shame, then I will do everything in my power to remain in the dark. I don't want to be found out. I don't want to feel guilty. I don't want to be ashamed. And when I'm in the dark, I might even be willing to fight against the light so that I'm not exposed. Jesus is the light of the world. But that's our scripture for next week. We're starting out our eight-week series studying the I Am statements of Jesus with the biggest I Am statement of them all. Jesus is the Creator God of the universe. Jesus is Lord of all, and what you do with that fact will completely shape and determine the rest of your life. What you do with that fact will completely shape and determine how you spend eternity. Do you believe? Do your actions back up that belief? What does your lifestyle communicate to a world that's desperately trying to figure out who Jesus is? As a 19-year-old Christian, I remember hearing a quote. Sorry, I was 19 years old. Brand new Christian. I remember hearing a quote at the beginning of a DC Talk song that I'll never forget. You probably will recognize it when I say it. The quote was, The greatest cause of atheism in our world is Christians. We're the greatest cause of atheism because we acknowledge Him with our lips, but we deny Him with our lifestyles. And the way we live tells an unbelieving world they must not really believe because they're not actually doing what they say is important, right? The reality of Jesus, who He is, demands a response. This isn't about picking the right religion. Religion could never save anyone. This is about having a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Yes, the Jesus of Christianity is the way, the truth, and the life. But Christianity doesn't save us. Christ saves us. This relationship is meant to be personal. Which is why He came personally. He wants to have something with you that's very, very personal and real. Who is Jesus? Do you know? Today the Holy Spirit is calling you to get off the fence. To quote the prophet Elijah, how long will you waver between two opinions? A lot of Christians are stuck right now. Maybe I'm talking to you. They've got a foot in belief and they've got a foot in self-worship. They get paralyzed in that state. And reality about who God is and what He requires and what He asks of us is not dependent on our feelings about Him or even our feelings about His existence in that moment. Truth is truth. If you keep His commands, if you try Him on for size, you will discover the truth. There's no truth to be had sitting on a fence. 
How long will you waver between two opinions? Believe, follow, and then you will know. Most of us here this morning are here because we've had our eyes open to reality. We were in the dark, but God revealed his light to us. We had questions about religion, and then we were blessed to enter into a relationship with the living Lord. We experienced God, and the Holy Spirit allowed us to see that Jesus is real. That's why we're here. That's why we worship. Don't sit on the fence. Make a decision. If you're struggling with doubts, face them. Don't just sit there trembling like a leaf. Dig into it. Jesus isn't afraid of your doubt. Do you want to know why? Because he's real. You're going to dig down. Oh no, what if he's not real? You know what you're going to find? He is. He would rather have you digging and working towards resolving those doubts than sitting on the fence, shaking like a leaf. If you're struggling with complacency, if your heart is numb, please reevaluate your life. Why are you just sitting there on that fence? Have you gone blind? Can you not see him anymore? Have you gone deaf? Can you not hear him anymore? Do you need to be born again? I've been there. The world can put us to sleep faster than a mega dose of melatonin or NyQuil. If you are sluggish right now in your faith, the enemy is probably drugging you with worldliness so that you will go to sleep the same way that a zookeeper tranquilizes a mighty African lion. Wake up. Who is Jesus? He is the great I am. He is our Savior. He is our King. Believe. Let's pray.